Um, my discussion is going to be on how a microfinance loan is processed and approved and kind of the internal processes and the external processes between the client and loan officer that take place. Um, so just a little background, two years ago I worked in Tanzania uh, as an auditor of operational procedures for the credit process for new loans for a small bank in Dar es Salaam that was a partner of Axion International. So first thing a loan officer does when he approaches a client is he starts asking, He first he checks out the business and writes kind of how stable is the business? Is it on a moving truck or is it in a secure location? He notes the geography. Um, he notes directions of how to get there in case he's not the loan officer in the future when collections need to take place. Um, you know, because there's typically not really an address for these stalls. It could be like a stall in a wood carver's market, third one from the right, um, you know, toward the back. So you, you, you make note of how to get there for a future loan officer to, to track down the client. Um, and you make notes about the appearance. Is the place neatly kept? Um, is there, you know, clutter everywhere? Does the guy keep books? Can you see the books? Um, is his cash register available or visible? So you, then you start interviewing the client. You say, you, you approach the top line revenue number three ways. You're trying to figure out the client's capacity to repay the loan. So you ask him, how much money would you say you made this week? And you write that down. You say, how much money would you say you made this month? And you write that down, and then you say, how much money would you say you make on each day of the week? So then you add up those each day of the week numbers, and then you check the you check to see if it matches the weekly number that he said, and then you multiply those by four to see if it matches the monthly number that he said. And out of those three calculations, you take the lowest one, so that you're, you're approaching it with the most conservative estimate of top line revenue. Once you have a sense for revenue, you start asking about household expenses and business expenses. So you ask about costs of inventory, you ask about home expenses, if they're paying rent, if they have to pay school fees, things like that. So you just get a picture of what the expense side of the borrower's, um, of the, of the borrower's balance sheet looks like. So you've got your top line revenue, you've got your expenses, you factor in whether or not they have a spouse and if there's any extra income from the spouse, and you add that to, to get a number that's called household surplus. So this is a really important number. So household surplus is kind of after all personal and business expenses are paid, what is the maximum amount of monthly installment that the bank could potentially charge um, this, this potential borrower? You then divide that by two, and you take a number that's about 50% of household surplus, and you recommend that as the monthly installment. So if your household surplus is around 200,000 shillings, you say, okay, this guy can afford to repay about 100,000 shillings a month, and that assumes in enough contingencies that... Um, that you know might come up over the course of the month. They might have a bad month in sales or a high month in expenses. Um, so say they have 100,000 shillings of household surplus when you divide it by two, you offer them or you suggest to them a loan size that was, you know, I would, I would, we would normally do loan sizes of 500,000 shillings um, at a 20% interest rate so that it would be 100,000 shillings a month for six months. Um, and that that uh, that allows for the 20% interest rate on top of the 500,000 shilling loan. You want to try to do it in whole numbers so that the borrowers can remember the amounts really easily. Um, so when you're when you're pricing out your total loan size, you want to structure it so that when you add in the interest rate, it's it's approximately a whole number so that the so that the borrower can remember to have that much in their account um, at the end of each month when their when their installments are due. So now that you've got your approximate loan size, you tell the client that you're going to take it to the credit committee. In the meanwhile, it's going to take a few days for the credit committee to review and approve it um, or, or come back to them with additional questions. In the meanwhile, they have to go down to the branch and set up a savings account. And they have to make some sort of a, a minimal deposit to open the savings account. The loan, when it's dispersed, goes into their savings account and then they can just go to the branch whenever they want and withdraw it from the savings account. So they have to go down to the office, open up a savings account. Meanwhile, the loan officer asks them for references and then he also tries to go back to the loan to the uh, to the client's place of business when the client isn't there to speak to nearby references about whether this person really owns the business, have they been there for as long as they as they said they have, um, you know, how busy is this area to try to get a more clear 360 picture of whether or not this person's telling the truth about their their capacity to repay. At the same time, he's trying to ascertain another factor called willingness to repay. So you've got capacity to repay and willingness to repay. Um, elements that might factor into willingness to repay could be 
has the person ever borrowed from a bank before? Do they understand the process of what it, of what it takes to borrow and repay every month? Um, do they have any other outstanding loans? If they have outstanding loans from local lenders that are a little bit more uh, aggressive, will they repay those guys first because they're afraid of getting beat up? Or will they actually come forward and repay the, uh, the microfinance loan? Um, you also want to get a sense for the guy's character. You know, is he the kind of person who, who does a fair business? You talk to his suppliers, you talk to anyone who works around him, you try to get a sense for how trustworthy of a person he is. So you take the capacity to repay and the willingness to repay in front of a credit committee that's comprised of the branch manager of whatever branch you're at and usually a senior loan officer or a loan supervisor, they're typically called. And then those guys will assess whether or not they want to approve the loan on the basis of the size that you recommend and, um, and the terms that you recommend. Assuming the loan's approved, you call up the client and you say, hey, your loan's approved. Um, it'll be dispersed into your account tomorrow or Friday or whenever you can, you can do it most quickly. The client comes down, withdraws as much or as little of the loan as they want, and, uh, and then that's the end of it. Then they have the loan. Then it's your responsibility as the loan officer to check up on the client approximately one week before their first installment is due to call them and say, hey, you know, like we talked about, you owe 100,000 shillings this month. Um, are you going to have any trouble making that payment? If so, let us know. If not, then uh, then you know, come down to the bank whenever you can and make a deposit. Um, sometimes what the clients will do is leave a, uh, a safety amount in their account to cover an installment or two. Sometimes the banks require this, as a matter of fact. Sometimes the banks require what's known as uh, cash collateral, so meaning you're only allowed to take out, say, 75 or 80 percent of the total loan size, and that remaining buffer of 20 percent um, is the first thing that's tapped if you are late on your loan. So you you know you miss the loan installment, they take out 10 percent or uh, they take out half of whatever you've left to cover your your missed installment so that you don't get charged penalty interest. Um, so that's typically how it works. And then you know if you a, a good like I said earlier, a good installment over household surplus ratio is about 50 percent for first time borrowers. Some branch managers that I worked with uh, liked it to be closer to 20 or 30 percent if they were in an extremely competitive environment where they felt like other microfinance banks were targeting the same clients and it was likely that um, those clients would take on multiple loans, then they would definitely recommend a smaller household surplus ratio um, or installment size ratio. So, you know, there were there were a number of other factors that, that branch managers kind of looked at. They would look at... Uh, they would look at what kind of neighborhood the business was in, um, whether they felt like it was a high traffic area and therefore could support a higher cash flow and higher loan repayment capacity. Um, they would look at whether or not the references checked out. They would look at whether or not the person might have collateral that they were willing to put up to backstop their loan, like uh, like title to land or a house, um, and what, or whether they had a guarantor. If they had a guarantor, they could secure more of a uh, of a loan size. If they had if they had collateral, collateral was a funny thing because um, the idea of taking collateral from a client at a microfinance institution is kind of um, anathema to the whole idea of Eunice and the group guarantee model. You know, you don't want to be seizing your borrowers' homes and taking them, you know, kicking them out of their houses if if they can't repay the loan because then you're actually making them worse off, and that's not the idea of microfinance. But the only examples that I ever saw of our bank going after clients' collateral was when the client had skipped town and was nowhere to be found or showed like an aggressive resistance to repaying and really felt like they were just not willing to cooperate at all. If the client was willing to come to the bank and negotiate with the loan officer and say, hey, I'd really love to make this loan installment, but it's been a bad month, maybe they got robbed, maybe their kid got sick, then, um, then the, the, the loan officer and the branch manager were 99% of the time willing to restructure the loan push out the maturity, give them more time, let them skip a payment or two and make it up at the end, um, which, you know, was a lot of what Axion had convinced them to do, to be more socially responsible, follow smart campaign policies, um, to kind of institute best practice of, uh, of treating your clients fairly and well and, and not making them worse off uh, for being a client. So I got to do a lot of that work. I got to go on a lot of recovery visits, which were at times a little bit kind of disheartening when you're watching a loan officer berate their client for not making a payment on time um, and threatening them and that sort of thing. It was it was a little bit kind of like an eye-opener into how MFIs are able to really keep their portfolio risk numbers as low as they advertise. Um, so it was a really cool experience. I really enjoyed it, um, and it kind of led me 
to my first job out of grad school, which then led me to this fellowship. So it was a good it was a good time. I recommend everyone who works for Grameen have a, a strong sense of what the Grameen microfinance model is and how to talk about it. And you know, even even now that I'm working in impact investing, we see a lot of the same idea of group guarantees uh, that that Eunice kind of pioneered um, in other aspects of, uh, of of credit finance. So I'll stop there. I think I've run over my ten minutes. Um, I hope uh, I hope you guys have some questions. I realize I moved pretty quickly. Do you have a? Is there a high or a low um, default rate on these loans? Yeah, I think um, I, the incentive program for the loan officers said that they had to keep four percent or less of their total portfolio over thirty days. Um, the par thirty number which is uh, your total portfolio amount that hasn't been paid within 30 days of the due installment um, has to be 4% or less of your total portfolio. So, so a good MFI would be down around 2% or below, um, an average MFI around 4 or 5%, and then bad ones is anywhere from 7 to 12%. And anything over that is really problematic and, uh, and is probably going to lead to a high write-off ratio. So yeah, I'd say, I'd say, and then, go ahead, Haley, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. You finish your no, I was just gonna. Response. I was gonna talk more about par ratios and write-off ratios, um, but cut me off. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, no, my question is uh, because I think Grameen has a bunch of mobile financial services. Did you see any impact um, of those products on repayment rates? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll answer that in two parts. So one is that you really see mobile banking working in Kenya and only in Kenya. Uh, when I was in Tanzania, the mobile banking market was very fractured and fragmented. Every different bank had their own mobile banking platform, and every phone company had their own mobile banking platform. And it was very easy to transfer money as long as you were transferring it within the bank or within the same uh, phone service provider. But it was very expensive to transfer it across platforms. So, you know, I was working with a bank called Akiba. Akiba wanted all their clients to sign up for their mobile banking platform, but they might have already signed up for a different platform, and they, you know, it, it, there were a lot of structural inefficiencies there uh, and transaction costs in Tanzania to, to doing mobile repayments. In Kenya, where I am now, um, we, we have a partnership with uh, an MFI called Musoni, which is a 100% mobile uh, microfinance institution. They do all of their disbursements and repayments over M-Pesa, um, which is a great idea in theory. It eliminates the hassle of borrowers having to go to the branch with a packet full of money and wait in line to deposit it. Um, but where we're seeing issues is that it makes it very difficult to lend to the poorest of the poor because of the transaction fees on M-Pesa um, M -Pesa mobile payments. So there's like a minimum of about a 25 cent transaction fee. Doesn't seem like much, but if you're only making a loan of say 50 or $100 and it's over the course of a year, and you'd like the borrower to make like $10 payments or $5 payments, then 25 cents, I mean, it's not negligible, you know, and, and, and we've, we've seen that it's actually more than they're willing to spend um, on, on a mobile platform and that they would rather just take the money to the branch and deposit it, um, even though that takes a lot of time and potentially, you know, opportunity costs better spent farming their land or whatever, uh, they still would, they still bristle at having to pay a fee to deposit their money. So, um, so Musoni has been more successful at targeting middle or lower middle income customers and less so at poorest of the poor um, because of that of that 22 shilling, 25 cent transaction fee. So, uh, so yeah, I mean ideally you have a costless mobile repayment method. Um, it hasn't happened yet and the fact that it hasn't happened in Kenya means it's probably a long way off because the M-Pesa, everyone uses M-Pesa here, but for that it's still a little bit too expensive. One of the issues that we that we did see a lot related to that, and one of the you know one of the recommendations I had at the end of my time was that they do implement a better mobile platform. Was that um, a lot of the customers who lived in peri-urban areas and were reliant on public transportation, which was often slow and unreliable, would have the cash on hand to repay, but simply didn't have the time in their day to take a bus up to two hours into the city, wait in line at a branch for an hour, and then take the bus home. I mean, we're talking about half their working day just to make a loan installment. So, so if, if a loan officer's um, portfolio at risk was spiking, what they would often do was actually go all the way out to visit the client, collect the money from the client in person, 
and take it to the bank themselves and deposit it on the client's behalf, which, per the operations manual, wasn't allowed. But the loan officers did it anyway because their incentive payments were based on getting their uh, getting their portfolios at risk down below a certain percentage. So I found that really interesting. Um, and you know they were breaking the rules to make their clients' lives easier. I, I thought it was fine. But you know they're kind of taking risks, and and it, it leads to poss the possibility of them pocketing some of the money and saying the client only deposited half of what the client actually did. So there's definitely um, there's definitely operational risk there as well. <laughs>